Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Paris Live PM. And our special guest today is Dame Felicity Lott, an English opera singer. Welcome, Dame Felicity. Thank you so much, Susan. Dame Felicity Lott has been singing in the world's most prestigious opera houses with the most prestigious orchestras and pianists and conductors for... May I say it, Dame <laughs> Felicity? A long time. <laughs> <laughs> she's still going strong. And recently she's added another plume to her hat and has taken up writing. Her book, Il nous faut de l'amour, or We Must Have Love, comes out on Monday the 14th, which, and she wrote it with a French cultural journalist, Olivier Bellamy. And it you can find it at the Boucher Chastel editing house. Okay. Why this title, Dame Felicity? Why we must have love? Well, I think we must. I think uh, we all need to feel appreciated, probably. But actually, the title, it was Olivier's idea. And I mean, he wrote it. He, he did most of the writing. He's French. It's in French. So uh, um, I did, yeah, I did quite a bit. But uh, but he thought it was a good title, and it's from an operetta that I sang in Paris quite a lot, La Belle Hélène by Offenbach, which was such fun to do. And her first aria is Il nous faut de l'amour, when she's in this crazy production. I was in bed at the beginning, dreaming I was the most beautiful woman in the world and longing for love, and my husband, who was... Michel Sénéchal, who was about 80 at the time, <laughs> and a fabulous singer and wonderful character. He was in bed by my side, fast, fast asleep, snoring, and I woke up longing for a bit of love in my life. <laughs> <laughs> One of your first loves was the French language. In fact, initially you thought you might become an English-French interpreter, but something happened when you were a young student in France that changed your mind and yes. your life. Yes, I, I was... Uh... I did a French degree, and as part of the degree, I went to spend a year in France, and I chose to go a nice long way away from England. I went to near Grenoble in the mountains to a place called Voiron, and there I was supposed to be doing English conversation with very reluctant French young people, barely um, younger than myself. I suppose I was 20, and they were about 18, and they really could not be less interested in doing English conversation with this strange woman from England. So that was a bit of a disaster. And I, you know, teaching was one possible thing one might do with the French language afterwards. Interpreter was going to be more difficult because you needed two modern languages and also you, ne you needed to be able to switch quickly between the two. And if you ask me the English word for anything in French, it takes me ages I can't I can't fight so I would have been a huge success in Geneva <laughs> anyway in brief I went to the conservatoire in Grenoble to try and find a singing teacher because I'd always sung and I thought I might fill up some of my f spare hours with singing lessons there and I found this lovely lady who was an excellent teacher and a divine woman who adopted me into her family and welcomed me and said, you know, if you tried a bit harder and did a bit of work, maybe you could be a singer. And I, this had never, although I'd always sung and I sang solos at school, it just didn't ever seem to be a possibility as a career, you know. Didn't, I didn't look right, didn't fit into my idea of what a singer would be. You said something in your book, you wrote in your book, that it was listening to Ravel Scheherazade. It was kind of the moment where you thought, hmm, maybe... Mm. Well, I, yes, she, this singing teacher sent me to a summer school in Nice and I met quite a lot of other young would-be singers and amongst them was a, a fantastic singer from Rabat in Morocco and she was singing something from Ravel Scheherazade, Aziz from Scheherazade and I'd never heard music like this. I didn't know French music and it was so exotic and voluptuous and seductive and she did it so well I was completely knocked out by this. So that was that was quite a moment and then I went off and found a recording of it by Régine Crespin who became my great idol as a singer and um, and also as a kind of mixture of French and music both of which were things that I was passionate about and fascinated by, and she encapsulated the two, so. What do you love about singing Dame Felicity? 
Well, pretty much everything except the stress and the, <laughs> the terror and the worry <laughs> and the with, will the voice work or not. I mean, if if your voice is kind of up and running and you're feeling well, it's not so good if you don't feel well because the problem for for a singer, of course, is that the voice is part of oneself. Whereas if you're a if you're a violinist who doesn't feel very well, at least you don't have to play on yourself. You've got something else outside. You can you can run your bow along, and a pianist has to play a piano, but he might not like the piano. But for a singer, you carry it all inside, and you're affected by air conditioning or colds or whatever. So sometimes it's it's not that great. But ideally. It's wonderful. You have to stand up straight. It's good for posture. It's good for breathing. It's good for, I don't know, all those feel good things that I can't ever remember the name of that, <laughs> <laughs> that make one feel pleased with life. And it's something I miss tremendously if I don't sing. If I have, I don't know, some time off at home, which is, I sometimes do, and I find all kinds of other things to it to do important things like the laundry and a bit of cleaning and sorting out and whatnot. And then I don't know, my whole body seems to sort of collapse. <laughs> and and I feel, you know, I, I just need the music to run through me. It's a very physical thing to be a singer, to have this these waves of sound going through one. Is it sort of en endomorphs or things like that? <laughs> what are the things that are supposed to give you feel good? Anyway, I miss that if I don't do it. So that's what I love about singing. And I love, well, all the different kinds of music, so many different kinds. I like a lot of kinds of music. I love the people. I love the my colleagues. To work with a pianist is great. I sometimes work with a harpist. That's different and great fun. With young musicians, with young singers that sort of want to still, you know, still want to work with me. It's It's lovely. Okay, here's the favorite child question. Out of all your roles, all of these ladies, which ones brought you the most satisfaction artistically? Um, that's a quite a difficult question because I think one is always so involved in whatever it is at the time. But the most, I suppose I'd have to say, the Marshallin in, in Rosencavalier, which is, uh, she's a wonderful lady, the Marshallin for people who don't know this story. It's not, I never really did popular opera. I didn't do Italian opera, so all the ones that people love, you know, I haven't done them. But but a lot of people do like Rosencavalier very much. And this lady who is the, she's not the central character, Octavian, is the young boy is the central character. And she's at the beginning of the opera, she's uh, having a bit of naughtiness with him while her husband's away hunting and he adores her, absolutely adores her and says, I'll always love you and you're mine, you're mine, you're mine. And she gradually, you know, in the course of the first act, she gets a bit tired of him being possessive like this. But she had, she loves him very much. But she says, one day, you know, you'll go away, you'll find somebody younger. And he's, of course I won't. I love you. I love you. Anyway, she's not in the second act. In the third act, he comes in to present this traditional silver rose on behalf of a rather boring old cousin of his um, to a young, beautiful girl. And of course, he falls immediately bang in love with this beautiful girl. And so the Marshallin, who was his, you know, your mind forever in the first act, suddenly has to sort of hand him over to this pretty young thing. It was the first pretty young thing he's ever seen. <laughs> she thought it wasn't going to happen quite as fast, you know, but she does everything with such grace. And she's charming to the young girl and she exits smoothly and, and everybody finds her quite a, an interesting and gracious lady. So she has wonderful music to sing, wonderful words to say, all about time and about growing older. It's very moving what she sings. So that, that's a, one of Richard Strauss's wonderful operas. Another one that actually probably brought me... Um, maybe equal fun was um, Intermezzo, which is a, a less, much less popular work, but a wonderful acting part. She's on the stage all the time, shouting, talking, changing costumes. And for somebody who likes the theatrical side of opera, it was a fantastic part to do, terrifying, but fantastic. <laughs>